Now I have the honor to give the floor for uh, the address to Natalia Shuklina, who is the vice director of the National School of Judges of Ukraine. Please make sure that you have the sound on, put on the microphone sign. Can you hear me? Good evening, dear participants of today's webinar, your honors, dear ladies and gentlemen, today on the Ukrainian part of the webinar, which is dedicated to a most important and relevant topic, the fundamental skills of writing judicial decisions, we have featuring not only Ukrainian judges and justices, but also judge clerks. And this webinar is being conducted by the National School of Judges of Ukraine, together with the Ukraine uh, with the American National Judicial College, supported by the USAID New Justice Program. As I have already noted, this webinar is really relevant and currently important for Ukraine. The National School of Judges of Ukraine, when upgrading the aptitude of both judges and judicial clerk, we pay a great deal of attention to organizing training sessions and workshops on writing judicial decisions with the aim to teach judges and hone their skills and as well as developing them the skills of writing effective and qualitative judicial decisions. We know that the Ukrainian procedural code, both civil and uh, commercial ones, as well as penal code of Ukraine, they identified the requirements for the judicial decisions and the National School of Judges of Ukraine has devised with webinars on writing judicial decisions for four jurisdictions, for the civil ones, commercial, administrative, and criminal ones. And when preparing judges and equipping them all, both local uh, courts and courts of appeal, uh, we include for them the standardized webinars on writing judicial decisions. I would also like to draw the attention of our today's audience to the fact that in 2017, the Supreme Court of our country also created a working group or a task force on writing judicial decisions headed by the secretary of the Grand Chamber of the Supreme Court of Ukraine, Mr. Kasyev. And we also invited judges and justices, the developers of the National School of Judges, as well as the developers of, of the Supreme Court to participate in today's work of our uh, webinar. Therefore, I would, would like once again to stress and to say that we will be both interested and it will be extremely beneficial for us to hear the experience to hear the experience of other participants on their content structure um, and the skeleton of the judicial decisions. This will enable both the developers of the National School of Judges as well as the judges and the developers for the Supreme Court of Ukraine to upgrade and probably fine tune our approach to writing judicial decisions and webinars based on that. I'm not going to take away much of your attention because the webinar is going to take two hours today. And I would like to give the floor to the head, to the chief of the party of New Justice Program, David Wong, for his greetings. Thank you, Ms. Vice Rector. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear judges, uh, dear judicial clerks, good evening, everyone. Congratulations on behalf of the New Justice Program, USC AD. It's nice to see so many familiar faces online again. First of all, I would like to thank the National School of Judges of Ukraine and the National Judicial College of the United States for their cooperation in preparing this important webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, the new justice program supports the National School of Judges of Ukraine in strengthening its capabilities to offer students modern curricula, both in the classroom and remotely, as it is happening today. Our program has assisted the National School of Judges in developing standard curricula and publishing case law manuals to improve judges' writing skills. After all, 
a court decision is a way of communication of the court with the parties to cases, lawyers, other courts, and the community. It is not enough for the decision to be correct. It must also be fair and clear, clearly understandable. One of the tasks of today's webinar is to encourage judges and judicial clerks to think critically, to think critically, I repeat, when writing court decisions, to think not only about what to include, but what not to include in the decisions as well, and also about how to write them correctly and clearly. This webinar is hosted by Sophie Sparrow, invited by us, a professor at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. She is a recognized authority on legal education, both in the US and abroad. And she is the author of many publications on legal writing. Ms. Sparrow will share with you, among other things, her experience with working on draft decisions, on improving complex and hard to understand pieces of the text, um, how to adapt them to average person level and mastering the technique of clear writing. I'm confident that this interactive webinar will help you to improve your writing skills, as well as increase both your productivity and efficiency. I wish you interesting work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. David. But before I give the floor to the professor, the host of tonight, to Ms. Sophie Sparrow, I would also like to say a few words about her. Dear colleagues, dear participants of today's webinar, it's a great honor for us to be introduced to a prominent academic, a professor, Liz Sophie Sparrow, from her biography, something I would like to draw your attention to, as it was mentioned by Mr. David Wong. Ms. Sparrow is a recognized leader in innovations in the United States in the area of legal education. And in the years 2012, 2013, and 2014, Ms. Sparrow was recognized one of 25 most influential leaders in legal education in the United States of America. She has been teaching at the Harvard School of Law. And she is um, a faculty member of the National Judicial College together with which we are holding tonight's webinar. Ms. Caro has been invited and she conducted webinars for judges, for uh, court officials, for legal <clears throat> workers in Canada, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Jordan, India on topics of professional development of judges, how to record your works in the most positive way, and the fundamental skills of writing judicial decisions. Therefore, I'm convinced that our today's webinar is going to be the best, that we are to receive fundamental and essential skills concerning the most fundamental fundamentals and basics of writing judicial decisions. And as Mr. David Wong has just said, this will enable us to write our judicial decisions and court decisions, just as you said, Mr. Wong, in a way that's fair and clear to all the participants of trial. And I would also like to say that all of the webinars that we hold with the support of the new justice program are always at the highest possible level and are greatly beneficial uh, the way we use it in our judicial activities. And I would like to give the floor to Ms. Sophie Sparrow. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I am really thrilled to be working with all of you, esteemed judges and clerks. Um, and I have very fond feelings for Ukraine because I was there uh, a year and a half ago working with faculty from some of your law schools in Ukraine. So um, this, you are doing a very important job and I just wanna honor that. Next slide. So 
So this session will be interactive. So I will have you be um, reading, critiquing, voting, speaking, and listening. So it's going to be all of the information we know about learning is that people learn more when they are doing things, not just listening to things. So with that, let's talk about today's learning goals. Next slide, please. Um, so today we want to talk about the context for judicial decisions, identify effective decision structures and parts. And so we can call these the introduction, the statement of the issues, facts or description as I see in your, in your rules of procedure, analysis or motivation and disposition or resolution. Next slide, please. Um, so first question is, aside from having enough time, what is the most challenging part of writing judicial decisions? This is a breakout room discussion. So I'm going to give you three minutes to just talk with the other people in your breakout room about what is the hardest part of judicial decisions. And this is quick discussion. So um, just one thing that you find, what is the most the hardest part of writing a judicial decisions. Please start the breakout rooms and we'll give them three minutes. Шановні учасники, ви всі зараз бачите запрошення приєднати participants all of you you can see right now invitations issued to you please would you kindly take these invitations we are going to have 40 rooms seven participants for each Приймайте, будь ласка, запрошення. Якщо щось не accept these invitations if something is not working out please write a private message to me and I will redirect you to the uh, rooms which are already operational. So the breakout rooms should close in a minute. Uh, 
uh, participants are not <laughs> not quite uh, uh, familiar with breakout rooms. So uh, in some rooms uh, it, it, it is very slow, <laughs> but but I believe that that we'll have several rooms that uh, will be ready to to answer. Shall I uh, stop breakout rooms? Yes. Okay. So that they will have, uh, they will still have 30, uh, six, 60 seconds. Yep, mm -hmm. that would be great. Thank you. So everybody is joining back in the room. Um, I'm interested in having maybe a few volunteers tell us um, what is the hardest part of judicial decisions? About a three second answer. And so I'm interested in if any of the participants would like to uh, turn on their mic and tell us one of the things in their in their group in their breakout session uh, short, what is something that was what is the hardest part of writing judicial decisions? First of all, is to start writing a judicial decision. This is what makes it hardest getting it started. Can I please add to that? Well, also the time, because we are always very limited in terms of writing a complete uh, judge's decision. It's always numbered days, working days or calendar days, but they're always clearly identified. And according to our legislation, the number of these days are, cannot be extended. And from the world and European practice, I know, that there are reasonable terms, but with us, it's a real conflict because we are faced with either quality or deadlines for writing that. In our room, though, we discuss the fact that we need to legally stipulate the desire of the parties when we write the resolution and the decision to include the complete text, whether the parties require the complete text of their disposition or not. I would also like to add something. For me, what is most difficult in writing a decision is when there are too many arguments that plaintiffs make references to, and the judge, first of all, has to identify the main reason, identify it and write it very briefly to make sure that this decision in its content and its extent can make, first of all, make reference to what the plaintiff makes references to and then provide arguments in order to explain and justify the requirements of the plaintiff. And the colleague of mine has just said that for her, if the lawsuit is very long, do we have to copy it in all of the details if it's as many as six to 18 pages? My opinion is that once again, you have to identify and select the key things, the main points, and write what the plaintiff makes references to, and then proceed from there. Thank you. Good evening. This is room number 10. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Along with the arguments just cited by my venerable colleagues, we also made an, a point saying that First of all, it was extreme, uh, expl explained by our moderator that we are always constrained in time limits, also the circumstances, the documents which are required, all of them have to be justified, and all of the reasons for that have to be um, well reasoned and explained in our judicial decisions, in our administrative courts, 
there may be as many as 120 requirements in lawsuits and we have to include it in our judicial decisions. There was also a question posed concerning amendments introduced to legislation. And sometimes there are deviations in the courts of higher jurisdiction in terms of how they write their judicial decisions. And it may also be a problem and a great issue with regard to jurisdiction. Even jurisdiction may be a problem. So this is what we had in room number 10. I would like to make my presentation on behalf of my group. We discussed that we had three factors we would like to stress. First of all, uh, the thing has already been mentioned. It's the extent of detail, all of the circumstances that have to be reflected in the decision. And the second circumstance, which also falls into two, is how to write a decision as a lawyer to a lawyer or as a lawyer to a non-legal person, because absolutely different way of structure and way of uh, presenting your thoughts and ideas will be selected. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, next slide, please. You all raise really important points. Um, when I do trainings for judges, one of the things I always hear is lack of time. Lack of time is always an issue for people and also just starting writing, like where to start, when to start when you have so much material. Um, and that's a third major issue that many judges talk about, which is how much to include. And do you have to include every argument of the parties and every possible piece of evidence? Um, the answer to that is you don't. But I think it's important to think about this list of 10 things, which is the important work that judges do. So if there is pressure, it's legitimate pressure because you have to resolve disputes, decide issues, inform and guide readers, explain results, do justice, because this is important to Ukraine and the rule of law develop the law, persuade readers of your correct analysis, show integrity, provide ethical and impartial decisions, and convey and build trust in the judicial um, system. So all of those are very important. And I think that that adds pressure to writing decisions because all of these things are important. Next slide, please. Um, what's really important, and this goes back to the last point that was made by a breakout room, which was you have to consider your context. Who are the readers? And we know we have parties, and we have attorneys, we have appellate courts, but we also have others. We have the media, we have people who are friends of the parties. Sometimes we have very sophisticated um, parties and sometimes we don't. And it's important to provide context for and to think about all of the readers um, because not everybody is going to be a judge or legally educated or sophisticated. And it's important to keep that in mind. So writing to, write to somebody who can understand it even if they are a lay person is very helpful. Next slide, please. So what we know about readers is, as I just said, um, some of them are legal readers, some of them are not legal readers. So we have a range of education, a range of ages, a range of experiences, and a range of reactions. But from the studies we have done in the US about um, readers, we do know some things, which is, next slide, please. That readers, this is a poll for you. Um, what are their general characteristics? So check all that apply. Complete the poll, please.
На шосту позицію, будь ласка, на шостий пункт не звертайте уваги. Перші чотири, такі як на слайді. Please disregard the sixth item. Only the first four items should be of your concern now. So let's let's can we see some results? I hope people have voted. Uh, yes. Um, many of you wrote that they're busy, they voted they're busy, tired, distracted, and stressed. In fact, readers are all of those. They are not sitting down to read judicial decisions as if they are sitting down to read a lovely novel. Some of them might, but mostly people are busy, tired, stressed, and distracted. And so it's really important that the opinions be very organized so that it's easy for people to quickly and easily understand what's going on. Next slide, please. So what do we know that's effective for readers? So these readers are, you know, they're busy, they're tired, they're distracted, they're stressed. And we know that they need the context at the beginning. They need to know what the opinion is about and what the result is. So if you're writing perhaps in a criminal case um, and the party is guilty or you've upheld it on appeal, give that information up front. People say, well, I, want, I don't want people to have the, the result up first, like which party won or which party lost because I want people to read through all of the reasoning. Well, the reality is that the readers want the answer first, then they can go to the reasoning. So give the summary, the conclusion first. Um, readers also like a clear structure, so they know what's going where. It's like reading a recipe to make borscht. Um, it's having some sort of a structure, some sort of a method that appeals focused issues uh, rather than a narrative that winds around and sort of travels and touches on a bunch of different things, it's much more helpful to have very focused issues and analysis. So if there are three areas in the analysis, perhaps you say, first, we consider this part of the rule, second, we consider this part of the rule, third, we consider this part of the rule. It makes it very straightforward. It's like, um, it's like signs on roads. You want to provide a clear structure. And thinking about number four, and thinking about signs on the road, you also want to provide headings where you have a title of what's to come. So this could be factual headings, this could be statement of the issues, this could be your conclusion on a legal point, um, the issue of the standard of review or the burden of, burden of persuasion, burden of proof, but all of those things, it's really helpful for readers to have headings. Uh, readers like plain language, so sometimes there is a judge in the United States who only likes to write uh, opinions which are very, very complicated for people to understand. And he wants people to have to go to the dictionary for every opinion he writes. I think it's very interesting for him to write those decisions, but it's not helpful for the most readers. The most readers are not interested in having a decision be a, a vocabulary document interested in understanding what the judges is saying. And lastly, they want conciseness. So the first thing that many readers look at when they're, remember, they're busy, they're tired, they're stressed, um, they look at how long the decision is. And if a decision can be written in five pages instead of 10 pages, that is greatly appreciated. Next slide, please. So there's five parts to decisions. Um, these correspond roughly with what I understand is true for your procedure, although some of them are 
not there. I noticed in some of the materials that you have as judges, judges writing manuals and things that there's um, there are things you have to have, and then there are things that don't appear to be uh, banned or forbidden. And so the first thing is an introduction. Having a very clear introduction is extremely helpful for your readers. It just sets the tone. It explains in a very few words what this case is about and what the outcome is. The second piece is a statement of the issues. So if there are four issues you are deciding, it's helpful to have those four there because that becomes your roadmap. Those four issues determine everything else that goes inside the decision. The third part is the de facts, or as I understand you call it the description, where the facts are the important facts are laid out. Now, this is not every single fact, but the important facts, the ones that are relevant to the issues from number two. The motivation and the analysis section is the hardest to write and the most important. This is where you show the rules and you show how the rules apply to the facts. And you use reasoning so that it is clear to the reader what law is being used and how the law is being interpreted and how the law applies to the facts. The last piece, the resolution or the disposition just has to be very straightforward. Next slide, please. This is what it looks like. So it just, it's broken down and you can see that there are headings. So there are headings for all the different areas. It's much easier for people to read when they understand where it is in the decision that they are. So we have a poll in the next slide. So this is the title of a decision. So which title, remember you're a reader, which title do you prefer? Let me give you a minute to um, choose your answers and think about the reasoning. Ten more seconds, please. Excellent. Most of you prefer the one on the right. And thank you so much for that. Um, it's you, uh, most readers would absolutely agree with you because if you just see a decision that says decision, it doesn't tell you what it's about. And it's much more helpful when you have like a sign that says, this is a decision about a particular issue. So even at the very, very beginning, it helps to have really clear guidance. It's not giving it away. It's not making it too easy. It's just making it very clear, which is exactly what we want. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you an introduction because we're gonna start with the part of the decision called the introduction. And I'm going to show you a paragraph in a minute. Um, and my question is, do you think that the judge who wrote this decision knew what they were trying to say? Did they know what they were trying to say? And this is a big paragraph or long paragraph, if you will. And so I don't want you to spend a lot of time trying to understand every word. I want you to just skim it quickly. Can we show the 
Next slide, please. So you've had a chance to skim this really quickly. Um, did we have a poll for this about which uh, whether the readers thought that they were, whether the judge knew what the judge was talking about? Yes, please. Let's. Do you think the judge who authored that knew what they were talking about? So take. Let's just give you um, thirty seconds. If you could just go ahead and vote, that's most helpful. Excellent. So some of you said yes, some of you said more of you said no, that the person didn't know what they were talking about. Um, my experience in reading confusing judicial writing is that the writers themselves usually know what they are trying to say. They just aren't saying it directly. So I was doing a judicial writing training um, a few years ago and I showed the judges there, an excerpt from a decision. And I asked them a similar question is, you know, what is this about? And one of the judges who was there and he volunteered and he said, well, I wrote this and I don't know what I was writing about. But he knew at the time, but he realized when he wrote it, after he saw it, you know, a year later that it no longer made sense. So I think it's important to remember that when you're writing a decision, you have so much information in your head. You have so much, uh, so much material. You've heard arguments, you've looked at evidence, you've seen the party's submissions, and there's so much there. But unless it's, you make it very clear to the reader, you have to organize and be really explicit about what you're talking about. So next slide, please. So in the introduction, introductions are, as I said, very important because they tell the reader right at the beginning. I understand that these are not part of the rules for judges, that these should have these in your decisions, but I understand that they are not prohibited. But it's very helpful to have an introduction that basically says, gives one or two, three paragraphs, um, depending on the complexity there, which is who, what, when, where, why, and how. So who are the parties? What is this case about? When was it decided? When did this all take place? Where, what court are we in? Why is this reasoning there very short? And how, how did you get to the results? Next slide, please. So here are two samples, introduction sample one and introduction sample two. I want you to read them both. And then I want you to, um, we will have a poll and you will be asked to pick which one you prefer. I believe there is third example. Shall I uh, turn slide to the third example? Sure.
Ten more seconds. Uh, share this, it's a second. Ten more seconds. Sample two, sample two and sample three. Um, were chosen more than any others. Um, I think that there are positive things about all of these introductions. Certainly sample two is the simplest. It's very direct, it's very straightforward. It's also shorter, which tells us that in general, we prefer things that are shorter if we can. Um, cutting out words we don't need is extremely helpful. But number three, so number two, number two is short and very direct. Number three is longer, but it also includes all of the essential information. It tells you what the issue is. It tells you what the plaintiff is asking for or the petitioner is asking for. And then it tells you that they affirm the decision. So that's extremely helpful. That's the introduction. The introduction, even though it comes first in the decision, may be something you write last after you have finished writing the whole decision and you know exactly what the essence is. I think of this as like a little, the introduction is like a brief summary of what you can expect. It's like a, a short description of a movie or a book where you just want to have an idea. What is the story here? What is going on? Okay, next slide. We are going to statement of the issues. Now, again, I understand that these are not required in your decisions, but it's very, very helpful. Um, the issue is the law and the key facts. And sometimes there are multiple issues embedded within one issue. So the parties may have just said the issue is this, but the actual analysis might require answering and analyzing several more questions. So it's really helpful to separate them out. I'm going to be showing you examples of issues. And again, I want you to read them and then vote on which ones you think, which one you think is most helpful. Next slide. Excuse me, next slide, please. So I'm going to have you vote on just those two examples. Which one do you think is more effective and think about why? Um, so ignore example three because we haven't shown you that yet, but as between one and two, please pick which one you find is uh, either you prefer or you think that readers will prefer. Example one, most readers absolutely prefer example one. It breaks it down. It makes it instead of one big long sentence, it breaks it down into three separate questions, which is very, very helpful. It forces the reader, it helps the reader understand what the situation is and it makes it very easy for guidance. Let me show you the next slide.
Um, this is a third example, and this is color coded to show you different parts of a decision, uh, parts of an issue statement. So the issue is in yellow. Um, the law is in green, and then the facts are in white. So one of the things to think about when you're writing about issues is the issue, what's the question, what's the relevant law, and a few of the key relevant facts. Obviously, you can't include all of them, but some of them are very helpful. Next slide, please. So this is the third part of the decision structure. We have these five parts. We have the introduction, the statement of the issues, and then we talk about the facts or the description. And the facts are, this is an area where I think it is challenging oftentimes for judges. And so some pointers I wanna give you about this. Next slide, please. So this is the judge's determination of what the true facts are. Um, it doesn't have to include every single fact in the case, um, but it does need to show facts that are supported by evidence. That's really helpful if you tell a narrative of the facts so that there is a story. So it's listed as it's people can follow the story about what happened. Um, and it's important to include facts that are essential to the decision. Now, peripheral facts may be included because they um, help the reader understand more of the story. But I think there's a fear oftentimes with judges that they, that they cannot exclude anything. And you can exclude things. You can stick to the facts that are relevant to the issues. That's why framing the issues is so important because if you have the issues, you can look at the facts and say, do these facts help, help me analyze or help show the analysis of these issues? Um, it's really helpful to exclude facts that are not relevant to the decision, even if they are stated by the parties. It's helpful to have a structure. Uh, most people find that a chronological structure is most helpful. Sometimes in very complex things, you may find that it's easy to, easier or it makes more logical sense to organize it by topic. So when was the contract formed? What were the terms? When was the contract breached? What were the remedies afterwards? Um, that sounds chronological, but there could be additional facts within that. But the idea is that you have some sort of organizing principle, not just plaintiff presented these facts, defendant presented these facts, but it's the facts that you find are the ones that you are relying on in your decision. Um, include some facts that are significant to the losing side. Um, oftentimes this is referred to as procedural justice, which is showing both parties that they are being heard. And so, but you don't have to include all of the facts, some of the facts, the ones that the party thinks is most important that are significant to the losing side. And then lastly, use headings, break it up with headings or titles if the facts are long. Next slide, please. So that we talked about do, don't, just restate each party's contentions, do this in the analysis section. Um, it's helpful not to include testimony that may come in later, um, either quotes or summaries, put this in the analysis section. Uh, omit weak phrases like it appears or it seems. Don't include legal conclusions and don't include needless dates. Next slide.
So let me just give you a minute to look at this. This is from a medical um, benefits decision. And I just wanted you to see the sort of one way to structure the, to the facts. This is in numbered paragraphs. So this is the way some judges like to write their facts. Um, some agencies, certainly in the US, actually require that their administrative judges write the facts this way. It's helpful in the sense that it's short paragraphs, which people prefer and are easier for everybody to read. Um, and it breaks things down. So there's only a few facts per paragraph. So one or two facts per paragraph which makes it easier for the reader to absorb. We have this, as humans, we have what's called cognitive load, which I'm sure you're aware of, which is when your brain just can't take in any more information. And so breaking things down into smaller pieces, smaller chunks, makes it much easier to understand. Next slide, please. So this is, let me give you a minute to read this paragraph. This is another way of writing findings of fact. This is more of a narrative approach, but notice that the language is simple. It's clear, it's very straightforward. It's like subject, verb, object, um, some dates, but not excessive detail of dates. And this statement of findings of fact also includes procedural history. So this is for an appellate decision that's appropriate to include in your statement of facts or elsewhere. The statement of facts is again, sometimes uh, some judges find it most easy to write the statement of facts first. Uh, some judges find that it's more helpful to write the statement of facts after they have done the analysis and they know what facts they're relying on. And one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about um, how to write decisions and how to write decisions quickly and efficiently is to start somewhere where you feel confident. So sometimes people will start with the facts sections or they'll start with the introduction section and then they'll move on and then they'll go back to the facts and they'll um, edit and omit things that they haven't taken, that they have, that they realize they no longer need or add facts that they realize they do need. So it's a, it's a circular process of going and adding and changing. Um, let's do this. Um, let's take a five minute break and then we will come back after five minutes just to give everybody a, a, a little break and stretch your legs. And I will see you back in five minutes.
Забыла маркерные штаны забрать. So welcome back. Could we go to the next slide? Yes, perfect. Yes, thank you. So we talked about the first three pieces of the decision, 
the introduction, the, the statement of the issues and the facts. And now we look at the motivation or analysis section, which is the most important of all of the parts of the decision. Next slide, please. This is the heart of the decision. It has to be based on authorities. It's got to include the legal standard or the standard of review. So it addresses all necessary, all issues necessary to decide the case. So I think it's important to, uh, in the analysis, to not just have a conclusion, but to base this on actual reasoning. Um, address every authority and argument. It doesn't need to address every argument. Um, doesn't need to address every authority, but it does need to be clear and comprehensive and address and answer the questions in the issues. It should avoid arguing, belittling, or advocating. So sometimes um, decisions sound as if the judge was perhaps annoyed with the parties or frustrated and it's better to take a much more neutral term. And then in terms of organizing it, if there are um, issues that nobody's going to argue with such as jurisdiction or if you need to decide one aspect of the law before you can move on, do that first and then go on to non just positive issues if you need to. Next, please. So what about the scope of the decision? Um, I think it's helpful to think about how complex your decisions are because sometimes the you can have clear law, clear facts, and all you need to do is to apply the law to the facts. Um, that's a pretty straightforward decision, and those tend to be shorter. Um, clear law, unclear facts, which is, I think, what many judges see. And so, in which case, you have to be more particular in identifying the evidentiary facts, making choices about them, and then applying them to the law. Unclear law, clear facts. That's where you have to decide the legal principles first. Maybe there are multiple interpretations or multiple laws or other court decisions that come into play. And then the last one, number four, um, is the most complicated because you have unclear law, unclear facts. The best approach is to be clear initially about what the legal principles are and identify them and why those are the legal principles, then identify the evidentiary facts and then apply them to the law. Next slide, please. So in this section, you want to look at, this is reasoning is essential. So what is the reasons, how did you arrive at your decision? And this is based on precedents, interpretations of statutes, constitutions, regulations, policy, practicality and institutional roles, the judiciary, legislator, executive, federal versus regional law, or a combination of all of the above. Next slide, please. Um, here it's helpful, you earlier identified, most of you identified that the statement of the issues where it was broken down one, two, three, was more helpful to you or to, was probably more helpful to legal readers than just a narrative. And the same is true for, in writing the analysis, it's okay to break things down into smaller parts, smaller chunks to analyze issue by issue. Um, sometimes decisions kind of go back and forth. They talk about one issue and then they talk about the second issue, then they go back to the first issue. And it's much more effective if you 
chunk is the word that is often used in the literature, but you chunk things up into like topics. The, so only the issues that relate, only the uh, facts that relate to the issue or the law that relates to a particular issue or sub-issue, those include those all together. Within the issues, identify the law first and then apply the facts. Because if you apply the law, if you identify the law first, what you're doing is you're showing the basis for how the analysis is gonna proceed. If you kind of, um, sometimes people talk about this as backing into the argument where they give a bunch of different facts and then they apply the law, it's easier for readers and for you yourselves later to process if you have the law first and then show how the facts relate to each of them. Include conclusions. So if there is a piece of law and you've applied it to the facts and you determine that the party has not met the rule, then state that at the beginning. And again, titles or headings, very important to have, very helpful to have after every two or three pages. Um, the studies on readers show that they, when they first see a decision, uh, they start off with a high level of enthusiasm. They're excited about it, or they're at least not, I mean, they're busy and stressed and tired, but they are willing to read, they are interested. They have a high level of enthusiasm. And then as the decisions go on, or readers of any kind of documents, as they go on, they start getting more and more tired. When they see a heading or a title or something that stands out and gives them a punctuation of uh, an example or a, a map, a sign of where they're going next, their interest spikes way up again. And then it starts going down the more pages you go, but then if there's another heading and it's set out what it is and it's a signpost uh, roadmap, then it's really, really helpful to the readers to process the analysis. Next slide, please. So here's another poll. You have five, you have five different headings. And the question is, which headings provide useful guidance? If you saw these, which ones would show you that you uh, understood where the analysis was, where the um, where the analysis was going to, where the reasoning was going to go from here? So you can check all that apply, read the headings, and then you think of them as conclusions about where the reasoning will go and then vote, please. Uh, can we, yes, perfect, headings. Which ones do you think you can check all that apply? Which ones are particularly useful in terms of providing 
a sign or a signal about where the reasoning is going? Okay, that's interesting. So most of you, uh, the majority of you, um, preferred recovery of overpayment. Um, it's very concise. It tells us um, it is probably not as effective a heading as some of the others. Um, and the reason for that is because it doesn't tell you, it tells you the topic, but it doesn't tell you the conclusion. If we could show the slide about the, um, yes, thank you. Um, if you'll notice, um, the first one gives you a conclusion. The judge did not abuse his discretion when he denied appellant's uh, request for relief. Um, it tells you what the, the conclusion is, and then you can read about why, what the law is, what the facts are. Number two, recovery of overpayment. It tells us that that's the topic, but again, it doesn't tell us, was there a recovery of overpayment? Was the government allowed to recoup the overpayment that was made or not? Uh, number three, the plaintiff lacks an adequate remedy at law. Um, I don't know if you have different legal and equitable systems um, as we do here um, in the US, but that's, um, that also gives a conclusion, which is that the, it, in order to get equitable relief, you need, an inadequate, you need to show that there's no adequate remedy at law. So that also provides you with a conclusion. Um, most people do, uh, find that headings that are in the form of a question are less helpful. So does the balance of equities here favor the photojournalist is less helpful, if you will, because it doesn't, again, it doesn't tell you the answer or the conclusion, but one, three, and five are all headings that tell you, tell the readers where you're going and you can expect from them that after that you will read, if that's the heading, that's sort of the first part of a section on analysis. And then there's going to be the legal aspects, the rules, and then the facts. So having headings within your analysis is incredibly um, important and helpful. Next slide, please. Um, another part, just as we talked about with um, cognitive load and readers being needing context beforehand. So when readers read a decision, they, it's very helpful for them to have an introduction at the very beginning of the decision about who, what, where, when, why, how, what is this decision about? Then also it's helpful to have a similar um, map if you have a complex analysis that you have to write. So it, this is a over, overstatement or an overview of the um, issue statement in a few short paragraphs. So this is, here are the rules that apply and an explanation if you have multiple issues, an explanation of the issues to each other. So for example, um, uh, a roadmap might say, we have to decide four issues in this case. The first issue relates to this. The second issue is dependent on the first. And the third one comes up to play when, um, because of the responses to one and two, but it shows you how they are connected or if they're not connected, why they're not connected. 
here is an example that I want you to take a few minutes to read. And it's an example of a roadmap from a United States Supreme Court decision. Next slide, please. So it's very logical, it's very straightforward. It shows you where it's going. And at the end, it says towards the bottom of the second paragraph, it talks about how the plaintiffs offer three reasons. And then at the very last sentence, it's, we consider each of these in turn. So showing the relationship about what the reasoning that's gonna follow. So think of this as, um, before the days of when we had smartphones and we didn't have GPS systems. And instead we had to rely on maps and signs on roads. And you think of it, if you are outside of Kiev and you are driving towards Kiev and it's a hundred kilometers away, you, would want to know, you would want to see the sign that says, yes, Kiev is 100 kilometers away. But then you also want reassurances that you're still on the right road. And so... So as you're driving, um, so you want to see signs that say Kiev 100 kilometers away. But then as you're driving, it's very reassuring and helpful to periodically get more signs that show you're on the way. So for example, Kiev 75 kilometers away, Kiev 50 kilometers, Kiev 20 kilometers, Kiev next 10 exits from the from the highway, um, these exits, south exits, these exits, north exits. So you're constantly giving what we say roadmaps or signposts to show the reader where you're going to enable them to follow the analysis as you go. Because these are, again, remember that these are busy, just like all of us, busy, tired, distracted, and have some stress in their lives. And so the more organized and clear we can make them very straightforward, very direct, the better it is for all of our readers, not just the sophisticated readers, but everybody. And it also helps the sophisticated readers. Next slide, please. Um, when you are writing the analysis, uh, there's a structure that we use called conclusion, rule, analysis, application, conclusion. And it's a structure that allows you to 
organize the writing in such a way that it gives you a formula that makes it easy to follow and shows the reasoning. It makes it it's very, very clear. And sometimes the conclusion might be um, several sentences. The rules might be uh, a sentence. The rules might be several paragraphs. Remember when we talked about the scope of decisions. And sometimes with the scope of decisions, if you have unclear law, then you have to spend several paragraphs explaining the law. But then you get into applying the law to the facts. So you're separating out the application of the law to the fact from the conclusion. And then the conclusion is again at the end. And you can see this in the next slide. Next slide, please. So you can see that the conclusion is in green. The rule is in yellow. And then the analysis and application are in white. So sometimes judges say this is uh, this is overly formulaic. It's overly simplistic. But when you're writing under time pressure and you have a lot of uh, a lot of decisions to write and not enough time to do it, it gives you a structure that works, and it also makes sure that you will be doing you will do reasoning that you don't just include the green part, the conclusion, um, or just the green part and the rule part, or just the conclusion and the fact part, but it includes all the necessary components of a decision, which makes it um, much more sound and helpful and has much more integrity to the judicial system adds much more integrity to the judicial system and allows people to follow your reasoning and abide by your decisions. The last, next slide, please. The last piece of the decision, the last part is the disposition or decree. Um, and that is, I think, pretty pretty straightforward, if you will. Um, that's where you're just, again, giving the results and explaining what has to happen next. Next slide, please. So at the trial court, this is the decision, so the actual disposition in the case, the remedy granted or penalty imposed, um, at the appellate court, you are affirming or reversing and remanding and providing instructions to the trial court. So I recognize that I have gone through this pretty quickly and given you a lot of information about writing this, but I want to sort of change gears a little bit and ask you to think about what are the costs of um, poor judicial writing. So this is the next slide, please. So what are the costs? Greater cost, more appeals, development of bad law, more litigation because readers don't understand the how and the why of a decision or lack of trust in the judicial system. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about these reasons and then to vote in the poll.
Шановні учасники, якщо не видно всі опції, трошки е, скролом проїдьте вниз екрану, там буде е, четверта опція. Dear participants, make sure that you see all of the four options. Scroll down the screen and then it will open up to you. Excellent. So we have some results. 43% of you said the greater cost, more appeals. 13% um, talked about the development of bad law. 74% more litigation and 76% lack of trust in the judicial system. Yes, in fact, all of these are um, significant costs of poor writing is that when judicial decisions are not written clearly in a way that there is solid reasoning, people can misinterpret them and misapply the decisions or not understand them and understand how these might affect future cases. It also suggests, particularly if it's not clear or straightforward or if there are um, very angry sounding dissents. Um, it may sound like the, the judicial branch is not, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same integrity and you can't trust it. So the more, even though these are very basic things about writing decisions, um, they have huge impacts. Next slide, please. I wanted to show you this because I think that um, it's helpful to hear that um, writing judicial decisions is not easy. So Justice Hugo Black on the United States Supreme Court, the most difficult thing about coming onto the court was learning how to write. This is hard. You have such an important job to do. You are doing such a great service for your country, for Ukraine. And this is hard work. It can be done, but it takes attention and being intentional about what you're trying to do and why. Now, I know you don't always have, uh, you don't, many of you understand that there is, um, that it's, you know, the lack of time is a factor and I recognize that. So let's talk about some of the aspects of the writing process. Next slide, please. So um, a lot of times, I think one thing to keep in mind is that everybody writes, everybody has a different way of writing and that the approach or the process that works for some people doesn't work for others. And some people, um, I have a colleague who I've written some books with, and he is a very organized thinker. He uh, basically writes one draft when he writes and he does a little edits and it is good to go. I am not that kind of a writer. I typically write um, in a more disorganized fashion. My colleague uh, makes very detailed outlines about what he's going to say, and then he writes it. And I have to use writing to understand what I'm thinking. And so my writing initially doesn't come out very organized, but then what I do is I spend, um, I try to get material down quickly and then go back and reorganize it and revise it. So people think of writing as just writing the decision. Well, it's writing, but it's also revising. 
where to start start somewhere start it doesn't matter where you start but i think sometimes people think i've got to i've got to be uh super clear i have to be super organized i have to do justice for the parties there's so many different competing uh demands on your time and your energy and your work product on your decisions that it's hard to know where to start but just start somewhere because even if you say i'm going to spend 30 minutes just writing part of this decision it will help you move forward so maybe you start with the facts maybe you start with what the law is but you give yourself um, permission to start wherever you have the most um, energy or feel the most comfortable and remembering that you can always go back and revise it so it doesn't have to be perfect the first time and um, one uh, writer who writes about writing in the US talks about how we have these four phases as writers and in the first phase we are a little bit um, crazy, if you will, and we're just trying to get ideas down and we're trying to make sense of the mess. And in the second phase, you talk about the architect. So the architect is now trying to create structure. So figuring out the different parts of a decision in our case, figuring out headings, figuring out sections and subsections. So they are designing, shaping the decision. Um, the third phase is the builder. So if the builder is coming in, the builder is putting words and text into the material. And if you think about a builder of a house, they are putting up the walls, they're putting in the electrical and the plumbing and they are adding um, the materials to the architect's plans. And then the last part of the writing process, the fourth part is the judge. And the judge is the critic who challenges everything you write and says, oh, I don't know if that's a very good sentence. You should write that differently. The problem is that it's not efficient if we try to do all of those four stages at the same time because we can't sort of be free flowing, generating ideas while we're trying to organize structure, while we're trying to build the text, while we're trying to judge it. So it's often very helpful to, instead of trying to get it right the first time, is to get something down on paper, have words on the page, words on the page, and then go back and reorganize them and make sense of them. This is hard. The more complicated something is, the harder it is to make it sound straightforward and organized. But that's our job as lawyers and as judges. Um, reflection, the second bullet there, this is hard and it helps to pay attention to what is working for, for you. So for example, um, I know that sometimes if I'm writing something that I know very well, I can do it in one draft, but it's if it's much more complicated, I have to um, just write in a very messy, disorganized fashion. And then I go back and make sense out of it. But I think it's important to realize what works for you and then, um, pay attention to that and use it. So for example, if you are driving and you know that one route from your office to your home is very, uh, usually has much more traffic and you realize like, I need to take a different road home because it's just too congested. Well, the same thing is here. If you're trying one approach and it's not working for you, try a different approach. The third one is use assistants if you have them. So share with your assistants how you like to see writing done and invite them to be helpful to you. Tell them what structure you want. Um, when you get to the judge phase, when you're editing, which is really helpful, I know that time is a constraint, 
but if you do um if if you have time and you can write your decision and have it in reasonably good shape and then go back and edit it let it rest for a few hours or even overnight and then you can go back and edit it and when you're editing don't think does this make sense um, instead think about think about your readers think about the people who are not lawyers who are not parties and how is this going to help them think about your responses to some of the things that you were reading on this screen about what worked for you and which kinds of um which kinds of writing you preferred and found helpful and then the last piece which i think is very wise advice from another judge which is that when we are incredibly busy um, what happens is that new information gets gets eclipsed, new information eclipses information that we've had. And so one piece, and this is true in a lot of different areas of thinking and writing, is that if you do nothing but write down something, something, your impressions within 24 hours of hearing a case, you are much it's going to be much more efficient and easier for you to go back and to look at it and to make sense of it and remember what you were thinking. So writing something down within 24 hours really gives you a jump start on writing your decision later. I'm going to, I know that we are quickly running out of time. So I'm going to skip this slide and go to the next slide, please. And ask you to go to your breakout rooms, if we could do breakout rooms and identify one specific step you can take to help your own writing. So what one step can you take to help your own writing? Can you put in breakout rooms? Great. Thank you. Шановні учасники, будь ласка, натискайте кнопочку Dear participants, please press the button and join the rooms. Professor Farrell, uh, do you have time yes. to take some? Do you have some time to take some questions? I do. Great. Natalia will help facilitate that for us. Great. Thank you.
Can you please give the uh, breakout rooms, let them know that they have uh, one more minute to identify a step that they can take to improve judicial decision writing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been most interesting for us to listen to all this and to see everything without much ado. I would like to say that five days is enough, enough for us to write a complete judicial decision. And we know that all of our decisions are in line with these requirements that you have just told us about. But we don't have enough time to introduce enough structure, clarity. It requires longer time in order to complete the full text, not five, but at least 10 days. And that would be enough because the level of our judges, I believe, is rather high for us to write judicial decisions at a good level. So once again, we're just constrained by time. Thank you. Thank you. Countdown down 40 seconds and as I see there were several rooms where there was only one participants or empty rooms at all not everybody joined so uh, but we'll probably have good good speakers because there were a lot of uh, full rooms good so we can close the rooms 20 seconds thank you I beg your pardon. Something I would like to say is after today's webinar, what matters for me is to stick to the structure of writing a judgment itself. But quite often, the judiciary of Ukraine, the system of judiciary of Ukraine, suffers enormously because most of the time, uh, judicial decisions, unfortunately, are not reasoned. And we have so many different opinions and approaches, and we don't have this uh, single vision. So sometimes even if we depart from this practice, once again, it has to be well substantiated that the plaintiff has to be heard or the petitioner that goes to court that wants his right to be de defended or protected. But as you said, the costs are really enormous for people when they go to court and they do not get the due decision. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of group 10, we would like to say that most effective would, it, would probably be to simplify the structure because these days we're using a new template. We describe all of the arguments of the parties, all of the petitions, etc. We duplicate and then we write also the same stuff very briefly in uh, the summary of the top, of the decision so it takes a lot of time and truly we try to single out and make things very brief and introduce summaries but i think it would be more effective if the structure was more accessible clearer perhaps but the great number of motions petitions lawsuits themselves do not enable us to keep this decision short because otherwise the plaintiff may think that they uh, they haven't been heard enough and uh, their arguments haven't been taken into account during the trial something else i would like to add is that sometimes we have decisions from my own experience i'm speaking that you are in a trial court and the party names different evidence and arguments, but the judges are not even taking note or record of these people being present. They just give a resolution and that's it. So I think there is contempt and this contempt results in contempt of court, you know, when such decisions unfortunately are uh, approved and this results in uh, uh, despicable decision uh, and attitude to the rule of law. Given everything that we have heard today, I think that complete full of full texts of decisions have to be done in very short terms and we have to use our judicial clerks 
and preliminary drafts of judicial clerk's texts definitely have to be made use of. And we definitely need to take advantage of some things after the trial. So that, just as you said, sometimes new information eclipses the previous information. Dear colleagues, I would like to find clarification, to say clarification point, that generally speaking, the judges of Ukraine are of a pretty high level and they know how to write their judgments. But it's a very big issue and a problem that Parties to a lawsuit write all of the circumstances, different uh, rules of law in order to single out the thoughts and the arguments to be discussed further on in the trial is really complicated. And this analytical work is really time consuming. So to make sure that the judicial decision is qualitative, we need to raise the level of not only judges, but also attorneys, that they have to be concise to the point, and they need to understand the difference between an argument and the reason, um, legal reasoning. So everything has to be unambiguous so that the judge doesn't sit and think, what did you want to say, and then start looking for the answer to this question. So these, I think, these points are really interrelated, the quality of a judge's decision and the preparation of a lawsuit itself. Thank you. Dear colleagues, as a follow-up to what has been said in Route 23, we didn't have any discussion going on. On behalf of myself, I would like just to add concerning the steps to take. First of all, a court decision Something that it uh, lacks is the introduction, and the Supreme Court of late makes such introductions in its decrees. Next, probably a lot of you have also noticed that in many decisions of the Supreme Court, they also write about, they take point by point issues. And it would be good to borrow this practice for trial courts and for the courts of appeal. And after all, one of the problems of judiciary decisions and writing is violation of certain essence, I would say, because structure is lost when we give the conclusion just at the end and people have to read some 10 to 20 pages in order to see the final conclusion. I think it's a direct violation of the logic. So what Ms. Farrow told us about, the basic fundamental thing, introduction, posing issues, the context, and including this at the initial stage, that's something that we definitely have to write. And I would also like to say that at the Supreme Court, I and the colleagues of mine, uh, judges Milokun, Mazur, Mishenka, have developed a training course for the justices of the Supreme Court concerning these specific points, how to in upgrade, how to improve, the text of judicial decisions. And we are also going to adapt these textbooks also for the first instant courts. And something that was said by the previous speakers, we definitely lack a training course on writing judicial texts, legal reasoning, legal writing, call it what you want. Sometimes there are some courses with the respective names, but unfortunately the content is not good enough. It's not up to scratch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we approach the end time defined. Uh, Professor Sparrow, it's Natalia. I'm very glad to meet you, ma'am, and thank you very much for your time. You devoted to work with Ukrainian judges, and you see how important topic you is you covered, uh, and absolutely amazingly how interesting you've done this. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, also, because this chat option allowed many participants to express their sincere appreciation for the content and for some of them, they writing it's unusual, but it's very extremely interesting and useful. So on behalf of our program, I just would like to thank you for for your great job to done this evening and to wish you all the best. Uh, thank you. And now the floor goes to Ms. Natalia Shuklina on the Ukrainian side. Thank you very much indeed again.
Дозвольте, будь ласка, і мені висловити буквально. Please let me say a few words because the National School began this webinar. Dear Ms. Sparrow, Professor Sparrow, I'm so emotionally ecstatic about these two hours that you have conducted with us. I know as a lecturer how hard it is to do such webinars single-handedly. So on behalf of the National School of Judges of Ukraine, the participants, judges, justices, judicial clerks, I would like to thank you for your very high level, professional level of this webinar. You have done it in a very constructive, way it's been interactive and you have managed to activate your participants because we have split into break rooms we have answered your questions we provided comments and you also had an opportunity to assess ukrainian judges based on their answers to your questions the all rounded analysis of the elements uh, in the structure of the judicial decision, your professional commentary to every element, your well-grounded comments and your professional advice and tips really deserve high professional level of attention. And I'm convinced that, that the judges that have featured in our today's webinar will definitely use them when they write their judicial texts. And the National School of Judges also developed such training materials on, um, on for four jurisdictions for our national judges. We will definitely review them in line with your advice and guidelines. In your presentations, in your uh, analysis, you also had very set psychological aspects concerning how decisions should be perceived, whether it's decision good or it was written by an aggressively minded judge. That's something that drew my attention, attracted my attention. So dear judges and dear ladies and gentlemen, you've been able to understand that the National School appeals to you that you have to develop and further perfect your skills of writing as judges and dear Ms. Professor has said that even the justice of the Supreme Court of the United States said how hard it is to write. We really need to learn to write judgments. And at the end of uh, my final remarks, there's something else that I would like to point out. Dear Professor, at the end, she asked a question she posed a question to our participants by saying, which are the costs to the judiciary as a result of that quality judicial text? I think this is the essence of today's webinar. Every judge after he or she takes the decision and then he wants to write this decision and then announce it on behalf of the state, the country, he or she has to be mindful of the fact that his decision should be in the interests of the state because it may also have a negative impact, negative consequences for the state, for the country. So dear Professor Sparrow, I would like to wish you good health, all the best in your life. It's been real high honor for us that you have made this time for the Ukrainian judges and conducted this webinar. And I do believe that we have laid ground in work for a very nice tradition in which we will share our mutual experiences and keep communicating. Thank you very much indeed and best of luck. This brings our webinar to a close. Ms. Irina, Ms. Irina Zaretska, I would like to give the floor to you in order to, to close our today's event. Thank you. Something I would like to draw the attention of the dear participants is the materials that you can find under the link that from time to time was featured on the screen and Anton, our IT specialist right now is posting this link in the chat box and there you will find today's presentation by Professor Sparrow. There will also be three handbooks, the first edition, second and third editions on writing judicial texts, judges' judgments, and also the handbook on 
the Ukrainian business Ukrainian language. The most updated form, please make use of these materials for your further work. And once again, I would like to extend my gratitude for this useful, helpful and interactive webinar, especially my words of thankfulness go to our professor, the host of today's event. And first of all, I would like to wish all of you strong health and peace. Thanks to all.